In 1923, when Paris was considered the capital of the Western art world, France bestowed the Legion of Honor, a treasured award, on a painter of biblical subjects. The painter's name was Tanner. Henry Ossawa Tanner. And although he was both trained and much celebrated in France, Tanner himself was not French. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Henry Ossawa Tanner was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in 1859 to Benjamin Tucker Tanner and Sarah Miller Tanner. At a time when the majority of African Americans endured the hardships of slavery, the Tanners were relatively fortunate. They were a cultured, educated, property-owning family. While Sarah Miller Tanner had been born in slavery, her husband's family had been free as early as 1800. But freedom from slavery did not mean freedom from racial oppression. Henry Tanner's father, a minister and later a bishop of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, was frustrated by a society which placed blame for racial injustice on its victims. In his journal, the elder Tanner wrote, If colored people would only do right is the cry from the Senate Hall to the country squire shanty, colored people won't do right. Right. What do they mean by right? Is it to see while yet their eyes have been put out? To love labor while yet they are taught none but the meanest work? To love their country while yet it brands them the most infamous on earth? To love their race while yet from infancy they are taught to believe their natural inferiority? If colored people would do right. Oh yes, to do that right, we would not be men. In 1872, Reverend Tanner purchased a house in North Philadelphia. His reputation and career as a minister steadily grew, as did the size of his family. Reverend Tanner had hoped that his eldest son, Henry, would become a minister too. But Henry had other plans. Endowed by his parents with a strong sense of self-worth and the belief that he was capable of achieving any goal through hard work, by the age of 13, Henry Ossawa Tanner had decided to become a famous painter. In his late teens, Tanner painted seascapes. As he described it, this was not a matter of chance, it was choice caused by the fact that at this time I had decided to become America's greatest marine painter. This decision was prompted by an article I had seen in some journal to the effect that the crying need of America was a great marine painter. Tanner later tried painting animals, sketching at the Philadelphia Zoo when he discovered that in America, good animal painters were even scarcer than marine painters. In 1879, when Tanner was 20 years old, he enrolled in the oldest professional art school in the United States, the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. His instructor was Thomas Aikens, a dedicated and inspiring teacher. Aikens genuinely supported Tanner's career and the two men began a lifelong friendship. Another successful Philadelphia painter, Thomas Hovenden was an important mentor for the young artist. Hovenden's painting, The Last Moments of John Brown, clearly had a lasting impact on Tanner's work. But Tanner's experiences at the Academy were not all positive. Some of Tanner's fellow students were far less welcoming than Aikens and Hovenden. A classmate described the following incident in his autobiography. He came, he was young, a light-skinned Negro. He was quiet and modest and drew very well. To cut a long story short, one night his easel was carried out into the middle of Broad Street 
and though not painfully crucified, he was firmly tied to it and left there. I'm troubled. I'm In his autobiography, troubled. Tanner later reflected on the difficulties of his early years. I was extremely timid, and to be made to feel that I was not wanted, although in a place I had every right to be, caused me sometimes weeks of pain. Every time any one of these disagreeable incidents came to mind, my heart sank, and I was anew tortured by the thought of what I had endured almost as much as by the incident itself. During the 1880s, Tanner nonetheless worked hard to establish himself as an artist. In Philadelphia, he supported himself in part with magazine illustrations, and he showed his work regularly at the Academy. Towards the end of the decade, Tanner moved to Atlanta, where he hoped to make enough money as a photographer to go to Europe and continue his studies. It was there he met Joseph Crane Hartzell, a bishop in the Methodist Church and a friend of Tanner's father. Hartzell and his wife organized an exhibition of Tanner's works. Not one painting sold. But the bishop and Mrs. Hartzell bought the entire collection, enabling Tanner to fulfill his dream. The 32-year-old Tanner arrived in Paris in 1891 and promptly enrolled in the Académie Julienne, a thriving art school that welcomed foreigners. Tanner proved himself an accomplished draftsman and made progress in his art and friends among his fellow students. Unfortunately, illness forced him to return to America in 1893. During this visit, Tanner felt most acutely the need for accurate portrayals of African-American life and culture. At a time when most images of blacks in paintings and the popular press both reflected and reinforced so-called scientific theories of African inferiority, Tanner set out to show how African Americans should be painted, saying that he who has the most sympathy with this subject will obtain the best results. In the banjo lesson, Tanner picked a stereotypical subject, probably on purpose, in order to show it in a new way. Instead of depicting a foolish-looking entertainer, the artist focused on a dignified old man, lovingly teaching his skill to an eager young learner. In 1894, Tanner returned to France. He stopped painting scenes of everyday life, including those of African Americans. Why he stopped painting black subjects still puzzles some of his admirers. Now in France, Tanner devoted his talent to images drawn from another fundamental part of his own life and experience, the Bible. Tanner's first major interpretation of a biblical subject, Daniel in the Lion's Den, was exhibited in 1896 at the huge annual exhibition called the Salon. The Salon was an extremely popular event. Each year, thousands of people from every social class packed the long galleries of the Palais on the Champs-Élysées to see the art selected by a special jury. For an artist, recognition at the Salon greatly increased the prospects of commercial success. Tanner received an honorable mention. His career as a biblical painter was launched. In 1897, with The Raising of Lazarus, Tanner became one of the few American painters, along with John Singer Sargent and James McNeil Whistler, whose work was purchased by the French government for the Luxembourg Museum of Contemporary Art. Several trips to the Middle East and North Africa enabled Tanner to enrich his special sensitivity to biblical themes. The Wailing Wall made a particular impression. He wrote, Never do I forget the deep pathos of the Jews' wailing place, those tremendous foundation stones of that glorious temple that stood upon Mount Moriah, worn smooth by the loving touch of tearful and devout worshippers from all over the world. Tanner returned to some of his favorite biblical subjects again and again, each time finding new opportunities to vary the theme. He 
He also found inspiration for his religious paintings from a more unexpected source, a young American singer of Swedish descent named Jessie Macaulay Olsen. They met while she was traveling through France with her family. Henry and Jessie fell in love and were married in 1899. She served as the model for the Virgin Mary in several of Tanner's most accomplished works. The Tanner's son, Jesse Asawa, born in 1903, appears with his mother in Christ Learning to Read, an affectionate tribute to his wife and child. Throughout the late 1890s and early 1900s, Tanner's success and reputation continued to grow at home and abroad. His paintings were seen in exhibitions from Paris to Rome, Chicago and Philadelphia, New York and St. Louis. White art patrons throughout the United States purchased Tanner's work, but in the mainstream white press, Tanner remained a Negro artist. At the same time, the response to Tanner within the black community was enthusiastic. Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois both knew him and praised his work. Black men and women throughout the United States turned to art, encouraged by his example. And then at a time when the painter could finally begin to savor the fruits of his hard work, war broke out in Europe. Profoundly depressed by the horrors of war, Tanner painted little during these years. He joined the Red Cross in 1917 and devised a plan to grow vegetables at field hospitals. A few drawings and paintings from this time record the Red Cross canteen where he was stationed. After the war, Tanner's success continued. But by the late 1920s and early 1930s, Changes in the art world and within the black intellectual community affected Tanner's reputation. The Harlem Renaissance, an artistic and literary movement in New York, called for the cultivation of unique African-American art forms. Tanner was faulted by some of the younger generation for not painting more black subjects. But, by the late 1930s, Tanner was an old man, coming to the end of his career. Paris was celebrating surrealism and abstraction, and Tanner's work, by comparison, seemed old-fashioned. Tanner continued to follow his own muse, pursuing his powerful inner vision, even while the world around him radically changed. Aware of what his work might mean for others, Right before his death, Tanner wrote of meeting an American Negro in Paris. He has probably never heard of me, as have not many hundreds and thousands of our people whom you might expect would know of my work. But it was not all for myself that I have tried in the measure of my ability to make a success of my life. On May 25, 1937, with fresh paint still on his canvas, Tanner died in his studio in Paris. A large obituary in the Herald Tribune announced, Henry Tanner, 77, dies in Paris, was American Negro painter. For I have lived his name in prayer. Today, a half century after his death, some of the challenges and difficult decisions that Tanner faced still confront contemporary African American artists. Born nearly a hundred years before the Civil Rights Movement, Tanner had defied the rigid boundaries of racial prejudice with his vision, his talent, and the courage to dream. <laughs>